The subcommittee on state foreign operations and related programs will come to order. Good afternoon. Good morning for some. I would like to start by welcoming our distinguished witness, the Honorable Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury. We appreciate uh, your time and willingness to testify. And of course, I take a lot of pride uh, knowing of your connections, of course, to Berkeley and the Bay Area. And as Professor Emerita, I at my alma mater, the University of California at Berkeley. So, so happy that you're with us today, Secretary Yellen. Now, this hearing is uh, fully virtual. Uh, we must address a few housekeeping matters first. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves if I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, and I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. And let me remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies during the Q&A. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will uh, retain the balance of your time. You will also notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn you to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I may gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time has almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. After the panel presents their testimony, we will follow the order of recognition set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called, at the time that the hearing is called to order. Uh, you will then be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules remind me, re, excuse me, require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. Lastly, uh, I may need to step out of the hearing temporarily and apologize in advance for having to miss some of the discussion with the secretary and my colleagues. However, in my absence, I've asked Congressman Price to chair the hearing and I appreciate Congressman Price agreeing to do this. And I am sure he will uh, lead a constructive discussion and I will return uh, as quickly as possible. So thank you again for being here this afternoon and uh, let me just say, I appreciate all of our members being here and thank our secretary for being here as we discuss the Department of Treasury's fiscal year 2022 budget request for international programs. The Department of Treasury has a very unique role in coordinating and facilitating our multilateral partnerships. As we tackle complex challenges, we need to work with our allies and partners in a manner that treats our partners as partners and demonstrates a willingness to listen. Our contributions to multilateral institutions are signs of our commitment to support global partnerships in order to reduce poverty and to build shared prosperity in developing countries. And this shared prosperity is for all peoples, for the most vulnerable, for women and children, for those who identify as LGBTQ+, for indigenous people and others who are marginalized and discriminated against. Our commitments to resolve some of the world's most challenging problems cannot be accomplished if we don't uphold fundamental values of racial equity and inclusion within the very institutions that we participate in. By acknowledging and respecting our differences and valuing that diversity, we can foster understanding spur innovation and promote accountability. Uh, Madam Secretary, I will continue elevating this issue and look forward to working with you on this. Now, the pandemic has devastated uh, economies and the World Bank estimates that an additional 88 million to 115 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty. The scale of need is vast and we must demonstrate our commitment to these people and countries. Otherwise, the lack of U.S. leadership opens the door for malign influences from Russia and China that undermine the systems of governance and entice governments to accept deals that plunge countries into debt and further poverty. And so I welcome your insights as to how best to coordinate with our multilateral partners 
to mitigate the humanitarian and economic impacts stemming from this pandemic. The fiscal year 2022 budget includes 2.5 billion to address the climate crisis, including 1.25 billion contribution for the Green Climate Fund. This is a step forward in reestablishing United States leadership and commitment to combating an existential crisis that ignites the root drives of hunger, strife, and instability, and that undermine the objectives of the very programs we fund to protect people and promote prosperity. It demands attention now, and I support the administration's urgent call to action. This year's budget also addresses the looming problem of unmet commitments to international financial institutions, totaling over $2 billion. Some of these arrears date back to the 1990s, and we should no longer ignore paying down these obligations. So I support this administration's recognition that this is a key priority. How can we be viewed as a credible partner while continuing to shirk our full financial responsibility? Finally, the Treasury Department's Office of Technical Assistance is an example of how a modest appropriation used effectively can make outsized impacts. I look forward to learning more about how the office works with ministries of finance and central banks in developing countries to strengthen accountability and transparency by improving the management of public finances and safeguarding financial sectors. Madam Secretary, the Treasury Department's international programs are a very important tool that complement the programs and activities of the State Department and USAID. As such, it's important that we use our influence and leadership to build partnerships and coalitions that collectively seek effective, long-lasting solutions. And so we have many issues to discuss today. I look forward to your statement and engagement with our subcommittee. But before turning to you for your statement, let me yield now to our ranking member, Mr. Rogers, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Secretary, welcome to the uh, subcommittee. We look forward to hearing your testimony on the budget request. I know you've been hard at work advancing uh, U.S. international economic policy in preparation for the uh, Group of Seven Leaders uh, Summit uh, that will take place uh, in the United Kingdom in the coming days. So we appreciate your very timely appearance before the uh, subcommittee. Madam Secretary, as you know, uh, one area of continuity between the prior administration and the current one it's a focus on renewed great power competition, particularly with uh, China. As the secretaries of state and defense have acknowledged, China is the only country with the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to seriously challenge uh, the rules-based international system. If we are to ensure that the global balance of power continues to favor democratic governance, Treasury will need to play a key role in challenging Beijing's model of authoritarian capitalism with a more transparent and market-oriented system. I hope we can discuss the elements of a successful international economic strategy to counter China in the uh, Indo-Pacific and beyond including our ability to offer a, a meaningful alternative to Beijing's predatory trade and development financing. The department's uh, fiscal budget request for next year uh, requests nearly 3.3 billion for Treasury's international programs. This amount is a key staggering 73% increase over the prior year. Key elements of the request include massive increases in funding to address climate change, meeting the annual replacement commitments of the World Bank and other multilateral development banks, as well as the new proposals related uh, to the International Monetary Fund. The increase over last year is due in large measure to an exponential increase in funding for the Green Climate Fund and its predecessor, known as the Climate Investment Funds. The latter of which was in fact supposed to sunset upon the Green Climate Fund becoming operational. 
This seems like the very definition of duplicative and wasteful spending, especially when the impact of these funds is questionable. At a time when American families continue to struggle to make ends meet and foreign aid is under great scrutiny, proposing such a significant sum of taxpayer funding for international climate change programs adds insult to injury. Finally, there are your requests related to the International Monetary Fund and the issuance of additional special drawing rights, an international reserve asset, to all IMF member countries. As you know, this is a highly controversial proposal that appears to be at odds with other administration policies, including efforts to counter the malign influence of Russia and China. This plan could result in billions in additional reserves being sent to the world's most notorious dictatorships and state sponsors of terror, such as Iran, Venezuela, Russia, and China. Not only does this scheme go against stated goals and objectives of the White House, but it could also hinder your department's efforts to penalize and pressure these malign state actors through your extensive sanction regimes. Why go to all the trouble of putting in place and enforcing these sanctions when your proposal through the IMF could significantly undercut years of pressure carefully designed to advance our national interest? Beyond these criticisms, uh, Madam Secretary, I want to point out the vagueness of Treasury's IMF-related appropriations request. It asks the committee to provide $100 million to uh, finance the costs of a grant or a loan or some unspecified combination thereof to the IMF's Poverty Reduction and Growth Fund or perhaps some other unnamed IMF facility. The details are wholly insufficient. Your motives uh, may be well intentioned, but acting with speed is often the enemy of sound policy. And I urge you to reassess your options and pursue alternative means to provide targeted and conditional financial assistance to countries suffering from COVID-related economic distress. Madam Secretary, I look forward to discussing these and other issues related to your testimony today. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your service to your country. Madam Secretary, I, uh, Madam Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I'll yield to Madam uh, Secretary Yellen. If you could uh, please summarize your oral statement in less than five minutes. Uh, I wanna make sure that we leave enough time to get to our questions. Your full statement, however, will be included for the record. After your testimony, I will be calling on members based on seniority of the members that were present when the hearing was called to order, alternating between majority and minority members. I will then recognize any remaining members in the order of their appearance. Each member is asked to keep their questions to within five minutes per round. So Madam Secretary, please uh, proceed. Welcome again. Thank, Thank you. you. Chairwoman Lee, Ranking Member Rogers, and members of the subcommittee, it's a pleasure to join you today. When I took office, one of my greatest concerns was a K-shaped recovery from the pandemic, a recovery where high-income households rebounded quickly or even emerged better off while low- and middle-income families suffered for a very long time. We can be confident now that's not going to happen, thanks in part to your support of the fiscal stimulus in the American Rescue Plan. The same, though, cannot be said of the global economy. Low-income nations haven't had the fiscal space to implement sweeping relief as we did with the American Rescue Plan. Even their ability to access vaccines is limited. There are still roughly two dozen countries, all of them low income, where more than 99% of the population is unvaccinated. In some ways, the economic divergence we feared here in the United States is happening on the world stage. By the end of the year, COVID-19 might push 
as many as 150 million people back into living on less than $2 a day. America is better off in a wealthier vaccinated world than a poorer unvaccinated one. That's undeniable. It will be much more difficult, for instance, to address global security threats like climate change if a good portion of the globe cannot make the effort necessary to green their economies because they're still dealing with the lingering effects of the pandemic. The United States must lead in addressing this global divergence. The Treasury Department is prepared to be part of this leadership. We just need the resources. By now, I'm sure you've seen the administration's budget proposal, and I call your attention to four areas. The first is funding for international financial institutions like the World Bank and the African Development Bank. During the pandemic, they've provided more than $200 billion to help developing countries stay afloat and fight the virus, including for vaccines. But they require more support, in part because the United States has not always fully contributed what it's committed. We have over $2.7 billion in unmet commitments to international financial institutions. And this will grow unless Congress appropriates funding to meet our current year commitments and pay down our unmet balance. The second involves low-income country debt. The pandemic has wreaked havoc on the finances of these nations. And if they're going to rebuild, many will need to address their debt vulnerabilities. The United States led in creating the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative, or DSSI, and the Common Framework for Debt Treatments for precisely this reason. But now we need to fund both. Without new funding, the United States could be forced to delay the multilateral debt process under the Common Framework and charge much higher interest rates on DSSI debt service suspensions. Third, our budget includes funding for the IMF's Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, an authorization to lend special drawing rights to it or another appropriate fund. This would be America's first direct contribution to the trust, and it will also help establish a trust fund that would support the recovery of low and middle income countries, as well as broader economic reforms that would improve the lives of their people. We're working with the IMF and other international partners on this. Fourth, on the other side of the pandemic, we have to help low income nations grapple with the reality of climate change because that's the only way we'll reach net zero emissions as a global community. Treasury's request includes roughly a billion dollars for this purpose. The money is to make sure that developing countries can adapt to the changing climate, but it's also to ensure that as these nations continue to grow and develop, they do so sustainably. Among other things, the funding would go towards expanding clean energy product production and conserving rainforests, which reduces emissions. The speed and strength of the world's recovery depend on the leadership of the United States in general, and I believe on the United States Treasury in particular. I look forward to working with you to ensure that we can indeed lead in the years to come. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Secretary. Let me uh, start out by asking you a couple of questions. Now, according to the World Bank, uh, the pandemic will push an additional 88 million to 115 million people into extreme poverty. Furthermore, the United Nations projects that there will be nearly a 40% increase for humanitarian assistance and uh, protection uh, in 2021. And so what's the impact of this level of poverty and humanitarian need on the economies and stability of low and middle income countries? And then secondly, in terms of just the administration's strategy for combating the pandemic's global economic impact and protecting these countries from sliding further into uh, economic and social instability, I'm curious as to how uh, your uh, department complements the work of the State Department and USAID. 
Well, thank you very much for those questions. Um, it, it's really um, a, a dreadful thing to see the impact that the pandemic has, has had on low-income countries and the World uh, Bank, the, the IMF, the Asian Development Bank, all of the multilateral development banks um, are providing funding first for vaccines, their purchase, their deployment, um, protective equipment, emer they're providing emergency budget support, cash transfer programs, credit to the private sector, um, help for food security, technical assistance, trade finance. Um, the total amount of support um, is impressive. I believe it's for all of those things around $85 billion um, to the end of 2020 since the pandemic um, began. And uh, they plan to, and we will um, work with them to um, continue to provide support uh, this year. Um, the pandemic is having a very adverse effect, obviously on uh, the economic situation in many of the affected countries. As I mentioned in my opening statement, we have considerable fiscal space to address its impact. And um, unfortunately, many low-income countries do not. Many of them are also mired in debt and unable to meet their debt service burdens. So it's been high priority for us to help them address these um, debt service burdens that are have become unsustainable um, to provide support to them for debt restructuring where that's necessary. And um, I think uh, uh, we have encouraged um, all those countries that can. This was a message I sent to the G7 and to the larger G20 that we need to use the fiscal space we we have to boost recovery, which will spill over positively to them. So we're trying to help both directly and indirectly. Ask you just as it relates to uh, corruption. We all know that corruption really metastasizes within people and institutions. And so I'm pleased that the Biden Harris administration has come out in front to tackle uh, corruption head on. So, Madam Secretary, how uh, is Treasury combating global corruption through its bilateral programs and multilateral uh, partnerships? And what does coordination across agencies uh, look like? Um, well, combating corruption is one of the um, key priorities of President Biden, and we're working to achieve that um, in a whole of government effort, certainly with state um, and uh, it's a priority in all of the work that we do bilaterally. Um, the support that we give, for example, through um, our treasury programs um, is directed toward um, shoring up government institutions, combating corruption, um, aiding transparency. Um, all of these things are really um, necessary for countries to be able to um, support their citizens and attract private investment. And uh, in our role with the multilateral development banks uh, and the IMF, uh, we have exactly the same approach. And we monitor projects that are approved very carefully to um, try to make sure that they address corruption and certainly do not um, sanction or promote it. Very much, Madam Secretary. Now I will yield to our ranking member, uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, it's little noted really, but the epidemic that's going on inside the pandemic is opioids. Uh, the flow of fentanyl and other opioids into the country uh, has been phenomenal in these last few months. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the only data that I can really point to definitively is the CDC's 
a statement that there were 90,000 drug overdose deaths in the 12 months ending in September 2020. 70% uh, of those are opioid related. So this epidemic is killing Americans at an alarming rate and it's getting worse by the day. Under your leadership, what priority does the department place on combating transnational criminal organizations, Chinese drug kingpins, and other foreign fentanyl suppliers who are engaging in the trafficking of fentanyl and other synthetic opioids and the laundering of proceeds from such illegal sales? Um, thank you so much. That's a very important question and concern. Treasury considers fentanyl and synthetic opioids an immediate threat to U.S. national security, to our economy, and to productivity. Um, this year, Treasury has met and briefed the bipartisan U.S. Opioid Commission on our activities, and that would particularly include sanctions um, against synthetic opioids. You mentioned uh, the Kingpin Act Authority, and under that authority, Treasury has designated and will continue to designate foreign traffickers of fentanyl and other synthetic opioids in their network, um, their networks. We've prioritized targeting of fentanyl trafficking by um, putting really significant investigative resources on this problem. And um, we focus our efforts against actors in the illicit fentanyl trade because we see them um, as vulnerable to sanctions. It's a place where sanctions works. Um, this is a matter where uh, Treasury very, very much values our partnership with Congress and um, look forward to working with you closely on this critical issue. Well, thank you for that. Drug traffickers and consumers increasingly use what's called the dark web to buy and sell their deadly wares, often paired with online payment systems and virtual currencies to further make anonymous fentanyl purchases and distributions. How is Treasury and your interagency partners working to counteract these criminal techniques? Well, I mean, that that's a core part of um, our sanctions regime that um, we, um, we focus on all the different mediums by which um, these illegal payments um, occur. And we're certainly aware of the use of the dark web and um, cryptocurrencies and so forth to facilitate these payments and are focused on that. Well, I appreciate that, and I wish you well uh, in this corner of your responsibilities. Um, it is an indeed uh, troubling, dangerous phenomenon that's occurring and taking Americans' lives. And uh, you are in a position of great importance in this fight. And we thank you for your dedication to it. Wish you good luck in that effort and Godspeed. Thank you yeah. very much, Congressman Rogers. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Now I would like to uh, yield uh, to Mr. Price uh, for his questions. And also I will uh, pass the gavel to Mr. Price while I step away for a few minutes. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, welcome, Madam Secretary, to the subcommittee. We appreciate your service and certainly your uh, appearance before us uh, today. Thank you. Um, I want to focus on uh, the uh, international financial institutions. This, the, the Biden administration has announced um, its determination to not only take the U.S.'s uh, seat at the table, so to speak, but to uh, actually bring uh, more proactive leadership to uh, participation in these multilateral financial institutions. So, so I, I'd like to ask you for a. a progress report on that in, in general. How have you 
shifted the U.S. engagement uh, uh, compared to the previous administration and uh, how the other countries responded. You, you have begun to answer the question in your, uh, in your opening statement. And uh, so let me just ask you more specifically the impact of uh, the, uh, the focus on climate change. Uh, there was a presidential executive order on January 27th, very early in the administration on tackling the climate crisis. And it had these interesting uh, words with respect to your office. You were charged with uh, developing a strategy, and I'm quoting, developing a strategy for how the voice and the vote of the U.S. can be used in international financial institutions, including the World Bank Group and the IMF, to promote financing programs, economic stimulus packages, and debt relief initiatives that are aligned with and support the goals of the Paris Agreement. And of course, that followed on a U.S. re-entry into the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, what are the implications of this? I mean, does it does this does this have an impact, for example, on the kind of appointments we're likely to see to the key U.S. positions uh, in these institutions? Uh, what uh, what is the range of um, of implications that this has for our participation, especially compared to what that participation has looked like in the past? Um, wonder if you have um, a tentative progress report to offer us today. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Thanks for this question. Um, you know, in my view and in the president's view, the United States and the world face a very profound climate crisis that. Um, we are committed to addressing. And part of the plan beyond what we're doing domestically is to substantially increase overall U.S. climate finance for developing countries to help them reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also to take uh, the remediation measures that will be needed for them to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of the crisis. So we are very focused on working um, through the IMF, through the um, World Bank, and through the various climate funds, the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environment Facility, the Climate Investment Funds. Um, all of these funds uh, provide support to help developing countries reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, build resilience to climate change, and in the case of the Global Environment Facility, address other challenges. Um, we, for example, just to give you an example, we, we clearly have um, asked in this budget request for an increase in resources to these funds, uh, a substantial additional contribution to uh, the Green Climate Fund and the Climate Investment Funds um, to be able to um, provide meaningful support uh, to developing countries to achieve these goals. Um, we are working with the um, World Bank to make sure, and the IMF and the other multilateral development banks, to make sure that um, their, their objectives, operations, and goals are aligned with the Paris Agreement. Um, we're working in other international fora, particularly with the G7, the G20, uh, to ensure that combating climate change is integrated into their work plans. Um, Treasury agreed to co-lead a um, working group of the G20 uh, on sustainable development and finance. We're doing that jointly with China um, to promote global cooperation around climate change. And I would say you, you mentioned the change in approach, and I would say that um, most countries um, express great um, appreciation for uh, the involvement that the United States is showing in engaging actively on all of these matters. I would think that uh, one of the implications of the shift you're talking about would be the need for uh, very carefully considered appointments so that we have the uh, we have the expertise that's required in the people uh, on the ground to um, to actually uh, move in these areas. 
well, Treasury has set up a climate hub to um, marshal some resources and make sure that what we're doing is well coordinated within Treasury and across the government. And we are focused on appointing people with expertise and uh, dedication on these matters. Thank you. Uh, Mr. diaz Ballard. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, uh, yesterday, the Treasury Department announced sanctions on individuals associated with the most recent crackdown of the political opposition in Nicaragua. Uh, and I thank you for that, Madam Secretary, and obviously urge you to continue uh, America's leadership in maintaining pressure on these anti-American dictatorships uh, and regimes in our hemisphere. So again, thank you for that. Um, let me shift to, again, a neighbor next door uh, to Nicaragua, close to Nicaragua. Uh, the Trump administration imposed uh, very strong sanctions against more than 100 Venezuelan individuals, as well as uh, banking sectors, petrol, digital currency industries involved in corruption, human rights abuses, drug trafficking, and also, again, hurting uh, the democrat democracy in Venezuela. Uh, they also sanctioned, by the way, some Russian entities or, or, or entities tied uh, with Russia, including a couple of uh, ships, uh, oil ships, uh, and including, um, um, uh, again, uh, some corporations like Evero Finance, which is a Venezuelan Russian entity. Do you intend to maintain these sanctions and to continue to aggressively identify those subverting uh, democracy in Venezuela or hurting, uh, you know, human rights? Uh, and again, impose tough sanctions, continue the enforcement against those who already have the sanctions and potentially, um, even uh, have additional sanctions against those that violate human rights in Venezuela? I absolutely committed to that, uh, Congressman diaz -Bellard. It's um, There's a humanitarian crisis going on in Venezuela, and it's really driven by the Maduro regime's corruption and repressive policies and economic um, mismanagement. Um, we have an active and committed program of sanctions there. Um, we have worked hard to ensure at the same time that humanitarian goods can reach the people um, of Venezuela who need food, medicine, and the like. But um, we, we have very broad sanctions um, in place and um, continue to work to refine and calibrate our approach. Well, look, I appreciate that. And obviously, uh, count on me as one, uh, if, if you think we can be helpful in any way. Let me shift to, again to uh, in the same hemisphere. The Trump administration also imposed tough sanctions prohibiting uh, transactions with the Cuban military. The same Cuban military that, according to the uh, OAS secretary, says that there uh, basically has an army of occupation in Venezuela that we just talked about. Uh, also sanctioned Cuban operatives involved in human um, rights abuses. So do you support these sanctions as well? And will you continue to enforce them and provide this sub uh, subcommittee with updates on enforcement actions? And again, will you be looking for others uh, to also sanction like you uh, just said you would do in Venezuela? And by the way, you're already starting to do in Nicaragua. So it is absolutely Treasury's role to administer and enforce sanctions and OFAC is doing that with respect to the Cuban assets control regulations that's consistent with legislation and administrative policy. Um, I would say more broadly, though, that the administration's policy with respect to Cuba is under review. Um, whatever comes out of that Treasury will um, play the role that we're assigned to to um, implement policy, um, and certainly we 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 are actively implementing sanctions. Well, I get that, uh, but again, obviously, you've expressed you, you've expressed strong support for the sanctions uh, against the human rights violators in Nicaragua. And I appreciate that. You've expressed support for the sanctions against human rights um, abusers in Venezuela and Nicaragua. Um, and so, do you support again sanctioning human rights abusers or abusers or sanctions against the military and the intelligence services and those who uh you know deal with uh, human trafficking in in cuba again you know that's pretty consistent right i mean if you support the other two i would assume but i don't want to put words in your mouth on that you would also strongly support those uh, on cuba as well would you not 
Well, Congressman, it, this is a matter that um, our relations with Cuba, that the State Department and others um, are reconsidering. And of course, I um, agree with you that corruption and repression um, are things that um, the United States is opposed to. But um, there is a broad review of Cuba policy, and I don't want sure. to try to get ahead of that. No, I get that, Madam Secretary. But do you see any less uh, corruption, uh, abuse of human rights, uh, any of the issues that we already talked about in Nicaragua? Uh, do you see that uh, being any less uh, um, aggressive by the uh, Cuban regime than the other two countries? Again, I just don't, I've, I've never understood, and not, I'm not, not on your part, I'm not, because I understand what your role is, but I've just never understood this double standard. I, I must say, I'm, I, it's hard for me to, I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable about the details to offer you that comparison. Gentlemen, well, time forward has expired. To, uh, Ms. Frankel, Ms. Frankel Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Madam Secretary. So, Hi. Thank you for being with us. So I, I think we all know that the, the pandemic has had a especially disproportionate impact on women, not only here domestically, but around the world. In fact, there, there was a recent World Economic Forum report that said the pandemic has increased the global gender gap by a generation, which means now, that we, this is sort of ridiculous, this, women must wait for gen, gender parity to close the gender gap. It jumped from 100 to 136 years. It was so it wasn't really good before, right? Uh, so the question is, uh, can, can you highlight some of the aspects of your budget request that will help advance uh, women around the world and especially those uh, in uh, developing countries? Well, um, it, as you noted, the pandemic has had a, a disproportionately negative effect on women in the United States and all around the world. and. We're supporting relief efforts from the pandemic um, all around the world, especially in the lowest income countries, very actively through aid of the type I've discussed, vaccine distribution, economic aid, debt relief, and um, the favorable impact of that will um, accrue disproportionately to women. But um, beyond that, um, We've worked with the multilateral development banks and with the IMF in um, over a number of years now to focus more heavily on women's issues and women's empowerment. Um, it's something that Treasury, uh, as a shareholder in those um, institutions, has um, pushed to do to have a focus on women's issues and women's security. Um, in the area of health, particularly to focus specifically on women's uh, health issues. And um, I, I think some progress is being, is being made. It certainly is a focus of our work with those institutions. Thank, thank you very much. Well, I think we're all, we're all here. We're alarmed by, again, the recent violence uh, between Israel and Hamas and uh, I just to make it clear, there's no equivalency between the two. Hamas is a terrorist organization, and although I definitely support uh, uh, relief, uh, humanitarian relief to Palestinians, as long as the, 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 the relief is not used uh, in a, in a uh, terrorist or negative way, I would like to know. Uh, does what role does the Treasury Department play in implementing sanctions or, or uh, to limit support to Hamas? Or what could what role could you play? Well, we do play an important role there. Um, Hamas has been designated um, as a target of the U.S. government uh, counterterrorism sanction programs. Um, we prioritize targeting Hamas and their supporters, um, including um, operational and political leadership, 
um, operatives, financiers, investors, and key global procurement uh, networks. Um, we have targeted a large number of Hamas-affiliated individuals and entities around the globe, and that includes um, a host of charities uh, around the world that have served as critical fundraising um, mechanisms. Um, we also work closely with uh, jurisdictions that are vulnerable to Hamas's illicit financial networks. That includes partners in the Gulf. We've, um, we work with them to improve their anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism frameworks. Um, we provide assessments of the state of Hamas's um, finances and um, work with foreign partners as well um, on sanctions designations. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fordberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you so much for appearing with us today. We appreciate your time. Um, Madam Secretary, the World Health Organization's credibility is on the line. Uh, when the virus, the pandemic first hit, the reports or the theory that this was leaked out of the Wuhan lab were roundly dismissed by experts. Now we have some credible intelligence that we shouldn't be so fast to dismiss that theory. But again, the World Health Organization is entangled in this as well. And given that you will receive funding to them, um, what are you doing to engage with the World Health Organization, the WHO, to clarify what it knew and when regarding the growing evidence that the virus may have leaked from the Wuhan lab? Congressman, I, I think we're not directly involved in, in that investigation or in overseeing the World Health Organization. I mean, do, we do a lot of work on health through um, our representation in the World Bank and the IMF and others, but we're not directly involved with um, the World Health Organization. I'm certainly aware of the point that you made, and I know um, President Biden has asked for um, a, a, an, investi an investigation um, into what happened in that episode, but um, I, I think we're, we're not directly involved in that. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Um, let me speak to you as well about China on another topic. China is by far the lowest, largest creditor to low-income countries across the world. Now, do you, are you aware how much China gives in direct humanitarian assistance and payments to multilateral funds to which they belong? The United States, just on humanitarian assistance, gives away about $25 billion. And China's development strategy, frankly, is this. It's predatory lending, it's resource extraction, and it's payment to authoritarian regimes. So in that regard, um, what are you, are, you, are you working to assure that U.S. funds and other multilateral funds are not being used by debtor nations to pay off Chinese debt? This would be an indirect subsidy to Chinese debt obligations by the United States and others. Well, I think that's a real concern, and it's one that we have particularly in the context of um, our debt relief programs that um, we have arranged the debt uh, suspension uh, initiative and the common framework, which is um, a framework for reducing um, writing off some debt that's unsustainable for very low income countries. So um, we have spoken with China about their participation. We have, they have promised to participate um, as equal partners uh, in these debt frameworks. We would be very concerned to you to see resources that are provided to these countries used to repay uh, chi Chinese debt that would defeat the purpose of the programs. Um, not all of the, there are entities within China that do lending that 
um, have not fully participated in these efforts, and that concerns us, and we have um, spoken to the Chinese about it, but this is a very valid concern, and um, it's one where uh, looking through, you know, transparency is um, also um, an important way of ensuring that funds aren't um, misused. Uh, well, I, I appreciate your sensitivity to this. It sounds like we need better parameters around it that we're at the sort of the beginning of this question and then putting an input or rather an implementation process to ensure that our subsidies to multilateral funds or assistance aren't going to pay off Chinese debt. That's, that's egregious. Uh, let, me, let me turn to the other question though. Are you aware of how much China gives in humanitarian assistance and to the multilateral funds that we all belong to? Um, I, I, they certainly contribute. I don't have any figures on that in I, front I think, of me. I think, yeah, I think that's the point is we need a baseline on this because again, China has this hybrid capitalistic communistic system that has caused grievous concerns around the world in terms of resource exploitation, lacks labor standards, lacks environmental standards, and then tries to achieve leadership positions in the very funds that go to clean up its messes many times. That's the point. Maybe we can return to it, Madam Secretary. Thank you. It's an important issue. I agree with you. Thank you. Doris. Um, thank you, um, Chairman, and um, good afternoon, uh, Secretary Yellen. Thank you for being with us today. Thank As you're you. aware, I am deeply concerned about democratic backsliding and blatant disregard for the rule of law in the Northern Triangle of Central America. Um, and as a, an appropriator, I feel strongly that we must ensure our U.S. taxpayers' dollars help the people and does not go against our policy objectives. Um, we cannot directly or indirectly prop up wannabe dictators and allow these uh, loans to support their attacks on democracy. Looking to El Salvador, in April of 2020, the IMF um, approved El Salvador's request for emergency financial assistance of about 389 million U.S. dollars under the rapid financing um, instrument uh, to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. That is not a small sum of money. The emergency assistance came from the commitment uh, from El Salvador's government, and I quote, remain committed to strengthen uh, competitiveness by improving the business environment, uh, reduce public debt, combat corruption, and strengthen the financial supervision and regulatory framework, and the governance and anti-money laundering counting counter financing of terrorism frameworks. Uh, the staff report also notes that the president assigned uh, the International Commission Against Impunity in El Salvador, also known as CSAs, uh, to in inspect the COVID-19 emergency funds and nominated a committee in charge and accountable for administering the fund. Unfortunately, El Salvador's newly installed Attorney General Council C says after that body referred 12 cases of potential corruption and procurement fraud uh, to the former Attorney General, including misuse of funds for COVID relief purchases by the Ministry of Health. This, uh, this was after the Legislative Assembly already passed a law granting immunity for COVID-related contracts. So my questions are, has your team and your colleagues at the IMF seen reports from CSAs on how this money was spent um, per the commitment that was made? Uh, and if not, will you be requesting these reports uh, and additional information? And given uh, recent development uh, and the government's clear efforts to avoid accountability and shield corrupt, um, are you confident that this money was spent as intended? So you've asked a question that I need to do some research in order to give you a satisfactory answer. I mean, I'm certainly aware of the money that went to El Salvador. It was, as I understand it, mainly intended uh, to help with COVID-19 
and his budget support to strengthen fiscal reforms. I'm not knowledgeable about all of the details you just gave, and I'd be glad to get back to you or have my staff meet with you to um, re review this situation. Um, thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate, um, you know, you following up in our at, from our last meeting. Um, I had a, a briefing with your folks, uh, ensuring that we are utilizing all the tools at our disposal um, to uh, file sanctions against corrupt individuals. Um, that has to be a priority when 70 cents of every dollar um, spent in the region you know, goes to corrupt hands. Uh, we must uh, be eyes wide open at ensuring that we are protecting, um, you know, this money. Uh, with that, I hope to, that we have a second round. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Ms. Price. Thank you very much uh, for uh, steering our uh, very important uh, committee hearing uh, and for your leadership. Really appreciate you. you Certainly. Glad you're back. Now. I think I'm yielding now to Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Chairwoman Lee. I appreciate it and good to see you back. I appreciate it. So uh, as everybody knows, the Biden administration supports a $650 billion allocation to IMF member nations for special drawing rights. <clears throat> These are, as you know, Secretary Yellen, uh, known as SDRs. This funding is disguised as aid to low income countries that's, I'm sorry, this aid is disguised as aid to low income countries, but the money actually goes to support nations carrying out genocide, terrorism, and even war crimes. And Secretary Yellen, you and I are in agreement on SDRs. You were quoted as saying that SDRs are, and I quote, an extremely inefficient way to deliver foreign aid since the money goes mostly to G G20 countries that have no need for this, end quote. So Secretary Yellen, just my time's limited, yes or no. Would a new allocation of SDRs, could that money be sent to countries like China or Russia? Those countries will receive allocations, but um, it's very unlikely that either country will use the allocation. Um, Russia... Well, Secretary, yes. Secretary Yellen, I'm going to reclaim my time. So, so yes, China and Russia will get an allocation. We can talk about recycling uh, later, but... Now, yes or no, if sanctions are removed from Iran, U.S. taxpayer dollars could be used, could be sent to the Iranian regime with SDRs, right? I'm sorry, could you, could you say that again? What, so if, if, yes, it, so if sanctions on Iran are removed, if the sanctions are removed, U.S. taxpayer dollars could go to the support of the Iranian regime through SDRs. I mean... Iran is a net holder of SDRs, but um, to use them, they would need to find a country that is willing to supply them with hard currency. And sure. Um, US, reclaiming my and time. And so countries the, would not do that. Reclaiming my, reclaiming my time. I'm sure the Chinese would, uh, would make an exception to Iran. Um, yes or no, these SDRs will benefit the Burmese generals with millions of dollars in foreign aid following their military coup and slaughter of innocent people, yes or no? No, um, Burma will not be able to use its SDRs. When a government is taken power by force, the IMF will not transact with it unless a majority of IMF shareholders say they recognize Yellen, the government. And that hasn't my, happened. My, Secretary Yellen, from my understanding, there are no conditions on SDRs. So because there are no conditions, this money could go to the generals that committed a coup, uh, not, could, and it could go to other nefarious actors. They will not be able to access them unless a majority of IMF shareholders say that they recognize the Burmese government, and that has not happened. But it, they it will is, not be it, allowed it is, to do it. It's possible. Additionally, SDR allocation could go to bail out financially mismanaged countries like Lebanon, for example. Yes or no? I'm not sure of the situation with Lebanon, but countries get SDR allocations. The money will also go to Lebanon. Um, yes or no? American adversaries alone will receive more money than low income countries through the SDR allocation, correct? 
Um, well, lo the lowest income countries will get about $21 billion worth of SDRs and um, emerging markets in developing countries, excluding China, uh, we'll get about a third of the allocation or about a little so bit Secretary, over the Secretary Yellen, as you said, so low-income countries will actually get less than 10% of this money. As you just said, they'll get $21 billion. Our adversaries will get collectively $68 billion. Even if you take out China in that calculation, this will greatly, uh, this will greatly enhance our adversaries and other G20 um, actors that frankly don't need the money. Um, are you aware that you would need congressional approval to allocate anything above $650 billion of SDRs? I, I, I can't remember exactly what the cutoff is, but yes. And do you think that's maybe why that you're trying to do be under $650 billion so that you can push this money out without congressional approval? Well, we try to evaluate what the global reserve needs are, and we worked with the IMF to do that. And so, that so you're telling me that we're, we're borrowing money, we're sending it to our adversaries, we're sending it to mismanaged countries that mismanagement, mismanage their budgets, we're sending it to G20 countries that don't need it, also that your administration does not need congressional approval to do a special allocation. Is that correct? Well, it is almost a costless thing to do to allocate SDRs. Um, in the first instance, there's no cost at all. And if we agree to exchange SDRs for hard currency for a country that comes to us, and we're not obligated to do that. Secretary, yep, do yep, do even it, the Wall Street Journal calls this monetary alchemy. There, there is a true cost. Uh, if, there, if there weren't a true cost and it was neutral, we would just give like trillions and trillions of dollars out. The reason there's a true cost is because if we're lending this money at, let's say, 2.3% interest over 30 years, an interest rate spike, which the yield rates we, probably will spike, we, we'll we, lose we, the opportunity we, cost. We, re, we receive interest. We pay interest on issuing treasury debt. We receive interest from countries that acquired the SDRs. We, so you're not, you're not counting for risk of default. It's virtually a wash. You're not, you're not, yeah, with respect, you're, risk. Not calling, you're, not counting for, you're not counting for risk, which there these countries could default. You're also not no, accounting it's, for it's not, the yield, it's, uh, steep yield curve with inflation. With all due, even the Wall Street Journal has called this monetary outcome. To yield now to, um, Ms. May. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, Madam Secretary, it's an honor to have you here today. and. Thank you so much for your work. Um, I have a few questions and, and, I, and I will try to uh, be respectful and allow you time to actually answer these complex questions that members on both sides of the aisle are asking, knowing that yes or no are, won't, won't suffice. So um, my first question is about Hezbollah financing. Um, while programs to combat terrorist financing are funded through FSGG, I did want to take a minute to ask about Hezbollah's financing, particularly using cryptocurrency. In August 2020, the Department of Justice announced the seizure of 300 cryptocurrency accounts, using, including 150 that laundered funds to and from accounts of Hamas's uh, al qassam brigades. Additionally, the Wall Street Journal reported that Hamas has seen a surge in cryptocurrency donations since early May. And the report cited a Hamas official who admitted that cryptocurrency is becoming a larger proportion of the group's revenue. Wanted to ask what steps the Department of Treasury is taking to address the growing threat of terrorist financing through cryptocurrencies and other digital assets. And how will innovations and technologies in the financial industry, particularly cryptocurrency, impact transnational terrorist groups and plots against the U.S. and our allies? Well, cryptocurrencies are often used by illicit actors um, who were trying to um, escape detection in moving funds. And so... Um, it does pose challenges, but um, a core part of Treasury's mission is to impede and immobilize funds. Um, when sanctions are in place, we have sanctions targeting Hamas and Hezbollah 
and their supporters, and um, we've designated um, a large number of um, Hamas and Hezbollah um, individuals and so-called shadow bankers that have um, helped Hezbollah move money, um, particularly through the Lebanese financial uh, system. And uh, while cryptocurrencies pose challenges, this is the core work of, um, of, tre of Treasury and its sanctioned regimes. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, wanted to ask uh, a switching gears, different question about the climate plan. Um, the directive announcing $20 billion from the administration to develop an Amazon climate financing plan for an important forest region uh, of our world. Uh, as you know, tropical and intact forests play a critical role in both mitigation carbon emissions and adapting to the impacts of ecological disruption from climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, what progress has the administration made in developing a climate finance plan for tropical and intact forests in the Amazon, the Andean Amazon, five forest regions of Central America and elsewhere? Um, I probably have to get back with you on details on that Congresswoman. I'm, um, I can tell you that our Tropical Forest and Coral Reef Conservation Act um, is something that we have been using to enable um, countries that are eligible to redirect debt payments um, to support uh, tropical forest uh, and um, coral reef ecosystems. I know we have uh, a number of agreements. Um, it, we're really running out of um, areas that we can where we can expand, where we have official bilateral debt, but maybe I can get back to you uh, with more details on what we're doing in some of the countries that you asked about. Great. Um, and in addition, and you were mentioning the Tropical Forest and Coral Reef Conservation Act, would love to hear about some of the timelines on completing negotiations uh, on the different swaps in the pipeline. Um, thank you, I yield back. Thank you very much. Okay, Madam uh, Secretary, I believe you have a hard uh, stop at uh, 12, uh, 3.30 Eastern time. So I'm going to ask uh, members to uh, comply with our three minute uh, time frame so that everyone can get in a, a second round of questions at, at three minutes. So I will uh, start, uh, Madam Secretary, by just asking you about the uh, budget request to pay down U.S. unmet commitments to various international financial institutions, which total over $2 billion. <laughs> the rears damage U.S. credibility uh, and really cede influence to countries like China and Russia. So I'd like to just know what the plan is for catching up with our payments and uh, why prioritizing paying down these arrears now when these funds should support other programs such as food security, global health, and what have you. Uh, so we just like to hear your, your take on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairwoman Lee. Um, we believe that sustained U.S. leadership um, can only occur if um, other countries know that we meet our commitments. And we currently have $2.7 billion worth of unmet commitments. Some of that dates back <coughs> to the 1990s. And really what we've seen over many years is that <coughs> these unmet commitments just undermine our credibility and um, the role that we could play in leadership. So we've requested a start. We've requested $489 million to reduce the unmet commitments we have. Um, we're uh, focusing the, the uh, paying down of unmet commitments to Ida, uh, to the African Development Fund and to the Asian Development Fund, which are 
the concessional arms of multilateral development banks that um, really go toward helping the poorest countries that are in need. And um, when we make these payments um, of previous commitments, they immediately enhance the ability of these banks to fund projects in the poorest countries. So they are augmenting the resource the resources that are available for those purposes. Sorry, I mean, we we hope in future years to um, pay down further on make commitments, but we think that this is a reasonable start and moves us in the right direction. Uh, okay, thank you, Madam Se Secretary. I will just ask this question. You don't need to respond, so I can yield to Mr. Rogers. But I'm I'm curious uh, about the Treasury's uh, role in helping to advance the, the sustainable development goals through our multilateral partnerships. And so I'm going to uh, offline or in a written response, uh, a written question, ask you to respond to that question. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, the uh, United States has not contributed to the Green Climate Fund in 2017, and the fund has not been the subject of extensive oversight in Washington uh, since that time. I understand that funding for the U.S. contribution is intended to come from both Departments of State and Treasury. Which agency will oversee the fund, and how much is, uh, how is that oversight conducted, and with what degree of regularity and specificity are the results uh, with this committee? So, in, in this year's budget request. Um, the administration has asked for $625 million um, on behalf of Treasury for the Green Climate Fund in an equal amount um, on behalf of State Department. So the total request for the Green Climate Fund is, um, is divided between uh, Treasury, Treasury and State. Apologies. Um, and, um, you know, we work closely with the Green Climate Fund. We have an outstanding uh, commitment to the fund. Uh, in 2014, the United States pledged $3 billion to the fund. We believe strongly in the work that they do and um, that it's the centerpiece really of providing impactful and innovative climate finance to the world's um, poorest and most uh, vulnerable countries. And um, we conduct oversight uh, in connection with our contributions to the fund. Well, what I'm wanting to know is uh, who is going to oversee that fund that we can turn to to ask questions? Is it state or is it treasury or? We, we do. We do it jointly with state, where um, we jointly represent the United States in the fund, Treasury and state. What steps have been taken uh, to strengthen transparency, accountability, anti-corruption, public oversight uh, in this climate finance governance? Well, there have been issues that have risen in connection with the governance of the fund and management shortcomings. And, um, you know, we have worked with other board members and management to uh, try to address issues that have arisen. Um, the uh, executive director has replaced uh, over the last year the head of human resources. Um, 
hired an ombudsperson, and we've been active um, with other members of the board to look look for uh, those management improvements. Thank you, Madam Secretary. How are you? Thank you. Now I'd like to yield to Mr. Price. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Secretary, I'm happy for the chance to ask you uh, another question. Uh, I promise you I will not demand a yes or no answer. Um, seems to be that kind of tactic. Uh, we've just seen the demonstration of how unhelpful that is at a hearing involving complex questions. I will share with you what I have sometimes said to people who demand such an answer in my town meetings. I have said to them, um, if you don't tell me how to answer the question, I promise you I won't tell you how to ask it. <laughs> you might. Uh, that, that occasionally works, not, not always. Um, so about um, the health work of these international financial institutions, I'd, I'd like to uh, give you a chance to elaborate on that. wonder what your assessment might be in general of the international financial institutions' response to the pandemic. Have some been more successful than others in their response? Have they coordinated it successfully? Uh, I'm particularly interested in vaccine distribution and, and maybe the World Bank is the uh, appropriate focal point here. Um, are there additional steps the World Bank should be taking to financially support COVAX? Uh, what additional steps could they take in coordination, of course, with, uh, with USAID, Gavi, the World Health Organization? What are some additional steps that might help us make sure that low-income countries are prepared to uh, deliver large numbers of vaccine doses later this year? So we've worked um, very closely with the World uh, Bank and the multilateral development banks to address the impact of the crisis and particularly to make sure that funding um, is available for vaccine purchase. Um, the World Bank is, I can't give you the exact figure, but I believe um, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and Inter-American Development Bank have collectively um, provided over $20 billion for the purchase of vaccines. Um, they have um, worked uh, collaboratively with COVAX. Um, their support programs go beyond vaccine purchase to PPE, um, distribution of vaccines um, and other medical supplies. Um, so there has been a joint effort to um, provide vaccines, to speed the delivery of vaccines. And the World Bank is um, also beginning to provide uh, critical financing for vaccine manufacturing as well. Um, in our judgment, vaccine manufacturing capacity is um, a significant bottleneck to increasing global vaccine access. And we've been working with the World Bank and with our partners in Act A to um, address uh, supply chain bottlenecks there. Um, the IFC has supported vaccine manufacturing efforts in both Africa and Asia. And quite recently, they invested in South Africa to boost manufacturing efforts there. So these um, organizations have been, um, I think, very active and effective in using their resources to address the pandemic. Uh, thank you. And of course, we all know what kind of a redoubled effort is, is going to be required here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to yield to Mr. Diaz Bayard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Secretary, while logic and common sense and much evidence shows a potential uh, lab um, leak, Wuhan lab leak, uh, you already mentioned obviously that there is an investigation underway, and I understand that, but um, as to you know where it came from, but what is clear is what the Chinese regime did: a report and quarterly review of biophysics, uh, uh, biophysics, biophysics discovery found that the PRC used, quote, deliberate destruction, concealment, or contamination data of data. Uh, Chinese scientists uh, who uh, wish to share their knowledge have not been able to do so or have disappeared. And we've now lots and lots and lots of reports about that. So while 
the investigation is taking place as to whether it was a lab, a lab week, a leak or not, lab um, leak or not. What is not debatable, I think, at this stage is that the Chinese regime ha- uh, held information, covered up. So here's the question. Um, are you looking at, at, at sanctioning uh, those responsible, not for the leak, because I understand that part's still an investigation, but for the cover-up? Uh, it, it's pretty evident that the, the Chinese regime did a very extensive cover-up of what actually was taking place. Um, so are you looking at sanctioning those who may have been responsible for the cover-up? So I think it will be up to uh, the president when he sees the results of um, the investigations that are taking place to uh, craft an appropriate response and um, sanctions is always uh, an available or all, all, typically an available tool that um, might be on that list. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no decisions have been made yet. Okay, I know, I, and, and I get that, uh, and, and you answer the question that no decision has been met, made yet, but again, I, I just would, would know that there is, I don't think, very much in dispute as far as the fact that the d- disappearance of scientists, journalists, a uh, doctor like uh, Yu Sen Zhou, uh, Ai Fen, uh, Li Wenliang, uh, Fang Bin, uh, Louise uh, Zehao, Chen Kuishi, and, and others who have died, uh, and the cover-up. So I just hope that, that uh, you would be aggressive. Uh, and I get the, the investigation my understanding is as to whether it was a lab leak or not, but the cover-up, uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of evidence already. So I would hope that you would have the opportunity to look at that. And I, I appreciate you doing so. And again, um, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. I'd like to yield to uh, Ms. Frankel. Okay. Oh, just, I was going to yield and let some of the other members ask a question. I do have one question for you. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you. So as you think about all this, you know, what, what, what do you see as the, as really the most important thing right now that you as a treasury secretary, and your, your agency can, can bring some economic vibrance back to the, the international community? So on many different dimensions, we are determined to reestablish U.S. leadership um, in international organizations and to work constructively, um, collaboratively with our partners to address issues of global scope where we can really only make progress if we cooperate. And that includes such issues as um, poverty and the impact of the pandemic, um, the debt problems of low-income countries, absolutely climate change is very high on our list of areas where um, we're providing leadership um, to collaborate with other countries that, uh, as we do, see climate change as an existential threat. So I think our, um, our partners around the world know we're back at the table. We value their collaboration with them in addressing matters of common concern. And we're coming to the table with um, leadership, with resources, and um, with effort to address common challenges. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I yield back. Thank you, Ma- Madam Secretary. Thank you. Now I'd like to yield to Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, I, I think this might be a helpful exercise um, that if we listed every multilateral fund that we are a participant in, along with other countries and their contribution, along with the benefits that are received by a list of countries, and then this more specifically, the governance structure. This, this is the, the broader point. Um, what are we doing internally to watch governance structures in these organizations to ensure that they are reflective of our values proposition, the very reasons, the missions that we are participating in these multilateral funds, 
and that they aren't um, redirected, so to speak, by other countries that have massive economies like China. China is making plays for leadership in multilateral institutions all over the world, but these funds tend to get overlooked in this regard. That's the first question. Uh, I think that would be a very helpful exercise to actually have this down on paper, but also go fund by fund and address the government structures. Do you have a, a system internally to do that? Um, we are served typically on the boards of these institutions and are shareholders of them. And Treasury very actively is involved in the governance of all of these funds um, down to the project level. Um, I believe my staff told me that um, we reviewed something like 1,700 projects last year to make sure that the design of these pro projects and the values um, in it meet our own um, governance standards that we concerned with um, anti-corruption, we're concerned about the impact that projects may have on um, indigenous people or particularly on women and um, that we are very active in making sure that we are funding uh, projects that will make a real contribution to um, reducing poverty, addressing um, human needs. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for the answer. I just have a few moments left. Um, let me give you a specific example as well. Uh, the Global Environment Facility, we fund them in the hundreds of millions of each year. Each year, I've been a supporter of their programs. I think they do tremendous work. The point being, though, I, I, I get concerned that we don't do enough internally to make sure that our case, our vision, uh, and the possibility of shifting visions toward a, a more holistic uh, approach to environmental health and security simply gets fragmented as we're looking at individual programs and projects. So the metrics by which we are determining the investment outcome of our money and the governance structures, I think I'm trying to get a better feel for how robust we're doing that. Well, Madam, I, Madam Secretary, um, Ms. Fortberry, could the Secretary respond to you uh, in writing because we have one more member uh, thank, to ask Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd be glad like to, to do that. that. To, uh, Congresswoman Torres. Um, Thank you again, uh, um, Secretary Allen. I want to uh, quickly um, say thank you again to you and your OFAC team for its engagement with me and commitment to work with state and others to increase the uh, quantity and effectiveness of the global Magnitsky sanctions for the Northern Triangle. President Biden recently rightly um, highlighted corruption as a national security priority and the creation of a regional anti-corruption task force for uh, the Northern Triangle um, countries of Central America should, sh uh, should put into um, action. I was also thrilled uh, to see uh, Treasury's budget justification include a little over 185 million, of which not less than 3 million is for addressing human rights violations and corruption, including activities authorized by the Global Magnitsky Human Rights uh, Accountability. Secretary Yellen, of that request for additional staffing, how many new staff members will be dedicated to Central America to meet this uh, new mandate of the Biden administration? It's a good question. I promise to come back to you with details on that, Congressman. Congresswoman. Yes, I, I appreciate you so much and uh, your eagerness to work with our office. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, uh, Madam Secretary, first of all, thank you so much for spending time with us today and for your testimony. I think uh, our members have learned a heck of a lot from you as it relates to uh, our uh, responsibility and partnership with the Department of, of Treasury. Uh, it really was a very informative hearing. It's really important that we uh, stand by our commitments to our multilateral partners and show that the United States uh, does not believe in uh, go it alone policy. 
uh, or approach to addressing uh, some of the toughest global challenges. Finally, uh, let me just say to members, uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to submit for the record, please submit them to the subcommittee within the next seven days. So this concludes uh, today's hearing. The subcommittee on state foreign operations and related program stays adjourned. Again, Madam Secretary, we really Thank appreciate you. the time you spent with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairwoman. Thank you.